do next? What should we do next? The idea of solutions. What can we actually do to solve things? I came to this meeting to, to mention something, and it was actually something similar to what you all were talking about. Um, last month, I, I tried to start Green Drinks again here in Tucson. It, it was a functional meeting, and it was just a preliminary meeting. Uh, a few friends showed up, some people from the Center for Biological Diversity. And uh, I was not impressed with it because I don't drink. Uh, and I was thinking what we really need is some kind of green works organization where people get together and do good works around the green community. Works. It's a way of, you know, everybody just getting together, working together and talking together. That's what I would like to promote. And so if anybody would like to work on that, let me know. I'll, I'll, I'm going to try and work on that. Give you your name again? Michael. Michael, okay. Uh, do you want? You have a website. You can. You want to? No, no, okay. It's just me. Okay. So a few, a few good ideas as far as solutions, like Waffle says, a club, and you say we have a place and Green Works. Do we want to try to form something that continues this stuff and actually makes what Waffles describes and what you're calling for that hinges on some of what Dave talks about? What do we want to do now? How Does do anybody we start? not want to do that? I guess is the real question. Does anybody not want to get together for any reason? <laughs> <laughs> Here. Yeah. Well, you know, getting together is a great idea. I mean, that's part of rebuilding community. And, you know, as Tom knows and as Jack knows, you know, we've gone through, God, I can't, can't count how many iterations of little local coalition groups. Um, you know, there's, there's a couple of core problems in forming coalitions, and this happens everywhere, um, especially with progressive organizations. I mean, you know, the progressive movement's been torn apart by sectarian factionalization for 150 years. And, you know, as you say, there's, we need, old-style organizing isn't going to do it. Old-style organizing is what got us into the mess we're in today. But to me, when we start looking at solutions, now we've got a list of actual things to start looking at <coughs> solutions towards. <coughs> and one of the first things I want to throw out is, you know, I think it's important to look at our framing. Because one of the problems with solutions, especially for a lot of activists, in both Europe and America, is that we tend to think of a solution as once we fix the problem, once we've applied the solution, then we can go back to business as usual. And that doesn't work. So I like to use the word responses. How do we craft dynamic responses to systemic crises, which are all over the place? So, I mean, so let's start with population. I mean, when you look at you know um, Paul and Anne Ehrlich's book, The Population Bomb, that came out in the late 60s, it's really interesting to look. It took exactly three years, and demographers have gone back and looked at this. It took exactly three years after the publication of the population bomb for birth rates to fall below replenishment levels in Europe and North America. So let's look then, as we talk about a response to overpopulation, what can realistically, which means it works for humans, can we do about the overpopulation problem? And it comes down to giving women freedom of choice to control their reproductive organs and the rest of their bodies as well. It comes about giving honest and open family education, family planning to everyone. It talks about it you know, revolves <coughs> around taking some of these aspects and looking at what we have as a technologically advanced society and the fact that we can supply pre- and postnatal health care to everybody instead of making it, you know, dependent on whether or not they can afford to buy the proper pharmaceuticals from the big, you know, from the big pharma in the U.S. and on and on. So there's some foreign policy issues that get involved in that. But we can do these things. But how do we actually go about doing that? Yeah, and then it's about building the coalitions to actually address the population. But looking at that within that framework of where we're looking, moving towards a sustainable future. Building so all coalitions. these things, building coalitions, but based within that framework so we can actually look at the things. Because, you know, looking at organizing, you know, one of the things that we're up against in modern culture, especially in enlightenment culture, is the fact that not only are we disconnected, but all of our organizing is based on hierarchies. It's based on charismatic leaders or something else along those lines. And it's not looking at the fact the way life works is everything working together. There's no waste and there's no greed in a healthy living system. 
And so we can apply these things, but we have to be willing to actually look at those underlying assumptions that we apply to it and then see if it actually is going to move us in the right direction. Because as we start dealing with the population problem, then we can start looking at the overconsumption problem. And why are we overconsuming? Well, we're overconsuming in a lot of ways because our natural senses of fulfillment are not being met in industrial culture. And so we have to start looking at ways that we can, instead of these addictive substitutes, we can start applying things that do natural fulfillment, which are available to anybody. I mean, they're available to any ecosystem, any species that can keep itself within, you know, its ecosystem's carrying capacity. I mean, at a very, you know, fundamental level, it's real easy to determine one way or the other. And so these types of things, and this is why I'm always pushing for, you know, adopting that framework that can support the common goal. And within that framework and a common goal, what are the set of values that we share? And, you know, one of the big complaints about the environmental movement, especially in the U.S., is that it's this white middle class movement. One of the things we can do is actually adopt the Earth Charter, which is, which is an internationally vetted people's declaration of interdependence. It works, it's been developed and vetted by South Americans and Asians and Africans, as well as Europeans and North Americans. And so there actually is this core set of values that we share as humans, and it's not just progressives. But when you start looking at that political spectrum, and, and especially apply some of these other things that have been done, I've, I've got lots of details, I won't go into them now. But looking at what the examples are of how these things work, looking at the things we can build on to bring other people into it, because there's a lot of movement towards doing things fundamentally different. There's the transition movement, there's the permaculture movement, there's the cultural creatives. There's all these different aspects of change and people that are involved with it. In fact, the majority of people on a global level who, as Paul Ray says with the cultural craze, there's 95 million people in Europe and North America and they all think they're alone. They all think they're the only ones that see what's going on and that things need to change. And so that brings us into looking, okay, what do we do about recapturing media and raising awareness with people and looking at how current culture not only does not work for life, but there's a systemic, pragmatic alternative mm -hmm. that is within our power to implement. Right. Simply by getting together and starting to go, here's how we start moving. Here's the framework. Here's what I'm passionate about. Here's how it fits within there, and here's how it moves it together. So as we come together as groups, as individuals or as organizations, we can see how our individual passions fit within this framework that move us all more towards the common goal. Okay. Because we can't do it as individuals. This is the last thing. It has to be done as communities, because that's the way life and works. And that's where we started. Yeah. So coalitions, what I heard is one thing we can do for a solution is support each other and make one big coalition of all these things that we get into differently. What else did we hear? Um, yeah, uh, fundamentally, all this talk about sustainability is founded in the, the need for, or the desire for self-preservation as a species. And why does this group think we can do it better than the, the rest of the species because they also want to preserve themselves. Mm -hmm. We think they're addicted, they're corrupted by short-term self-interest, uh, corporations, or bureaucracy, all of those reasons. But do we really think we can do it? If we have the same common goal, then why can't we work together? And why is it an us and them? That's the key. That's the key. Also, also, uh, yeah, this, the fundamental assumption, what would be the problem if the human race went extinct? We're like, like any other species that has gone extinct and the planet were a cinder. Is there some higher purpose to humankind than self-preservation? And to me, that's the fundamental question, and what is that? Well, that's a pretty spiritual thing. I think I see on the context of this meeting. Okay. But definitely consciousness evolution plays a role in the evolution of, of, of life. And I would say it is fundamental to what we're doing. That that's what Absolutely. we're hoping. We're nudging the bar of uh, human <clears throat> consciousness, group together human consciousness. And I'm hoping there's about 100 different groups going on simultaneously in this part of the world anyway, at the same time doing exactly what we're doing, because that's who we got to like connect with. And maybe that's why we're here, because we're feeling it like they're yeah, feeling exactly. it. In other living rooms, they're doing the same thing. Yeah. So if we support each other in all of our works, Jack. 
on a, the the function of of understanding what are the conditions that sustain life. I mean, what, what are the conditions we're in and what are the conditions that sustain life? Like Dave was speaking to that, that accord, that international accord. Um, you know, whether or not we go extinct is, isn't the question. It's like, what do we do while or before we go extinct? You know, don't answer your phone. It's one of them. Yeah. Um, Whose phone is it? It's mine. Yeah. <laughs> the universe is cheering you on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably not, actually. But, but, but that that idea of of a of a, a true understanding of systems is 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 a knowledge base that that is is available and and so is is a beautiful thing. You know, it's not a, a us are better. Or whatever, it's a it's a it's a dawning global realization of what sustains life, which which means there's there's all these other species going extinct because of us, and I mean that's happening all all over the place, and and it's every like day. what every day every, every day, and so because we don't know how to sustain life, and so we seem to be here living. And that looks like one of the questions that's been put to us. And, you know, what are we going to do with that? And, and, I, and I, so I, I totally applaud Dave for having examined this question so thoroughly that, you know, I would say listen to what he's saying because it's just, it's, he's, it's not him saying it as him. It's him saying it as, as a, a, a focus of it. And and that's that's some real massive legwork and, and so thank you, Dave. You did. And everybody else here. Yeah, can I say something now here, real quick? Mm -hmm. Here. And then I'll I'll pass it on here. Watch your finger. Um right now we have everything ready to go. You know, we're talking about what are the solutions. I'm I'm here actually more about when are we gonna take the solutions and do something with it? And what we are looking for today are the engineers, the electricians, the benevolent people who have the resources we're looking for that we can list. Somebody who can read that stuff, because I certainly can't read all of it, but these are patents. And there's a patent process in the United States that inventors have to go through in order to have a patent number given to them. Am I, if anybody here knows more about that, please, I would love your input on this, but it would seem to me that he would not have that patent, which we can actually document and, and you know, empirically determine its validity or not. Uh, it would seem to me that it's a valid enough, at least worth examining. So we can talk about this all day long, but if we're not sitting here building this stuff, then we are all remiss. You know, because we can talk and talk and talk about all the other talks we're going to have. But now, yes. Excuse me. I yes. was just wondering because um, you know, with free energy, and let's let's say we tap into it, hmm. unless we have a framework in in order to use it, might we not just perpetuate more of what we're doing now with yes. the energy that we're paying for? I'm just wondering if. if the group of people who are looking into free energy are also looking, you know, at that at that level. Careful with free energy because people, you have to be careful with free energy because a lot of the population of this planet just doesn't have enough wisdom to be able to use free energy in a in a way that is good for the environment. They'll cut down all the trees and build nice houses. They'll divert the waters and build nice dams and lakes and, you know, all of this great stuff if they've got all the energy to use. And that's not necessarily such a good thing. So if you use, if you give the world free energy, you have to give the world some guidelines to use it. Uh, right now we've got limitations. Mostly the richest people have access to as much petroleum as they want. But if you have free energy, then you need to make sure that there's a lot of people out there that don't have the marbles together to know not to cut down all the trees. Mm -hmm. okay. 
I, I feel that the core issue is the relationship between women and men. And this has been dysfunctional for centuries. How do we change that? I think one of the problems is that we do live in houses that isolates people and it's coupling, this uh, codependent coupling that is toxic to the planet. It cuts down trees. It um, makes it impossible for us to build community. And then we have to work on, when we're living collectively, how do we deal with the erotic energy and uh, a different kind of relationship between people? <coughs> Uh, so I think it's all about love and erotic love, figuring it out, and it's very difficult to do that if we live in the American dream. The American dream is the killer. Yeah, to follow off what she said about love, this uh, free energy technology we're talking about is basically the science, the physics behind love, that we've actually got to the point where we've figured out how it works on a molecular standpoint. And it goes a lot further than just free energy and just disconnecting from the grid. We're talking about the ability to clean all water. We're talking the ability to create water. We're talking about the ability to change the actual matter before you changing the frequency of the matter into another object. I know this is really hard to believe, but I mean, <laughs> this, it's just the reality of the situation. And it's, it's in the patents. It can, it can literally solve just about every single problem that we have on the, in the world today. Um, and we have that on our fingertips right now. It's just <laughs> how to put the pieces um, in the right spot. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, I just wanted to like get a little clarity because I've been involved with processes and meetings before, and uh, when we start talking about the we, we got to do this, we got to do that, and I look around the room, fifteen men, four women, th three men with shorts, four hats. Okay, now we get, a, we get a sense of who we are. We're 15 men and four women. And in that, what is our innate power? What can we do with 15 men and four women? And let me say this, words, the European dialectic, which we've inherited over thousands of years, can take six words and make it sound so simple and easy. Six words. I am going to climb Mount Everest. It's going to take me two, three years to do those six words. So here we are, a group. Our intentions are all noble and of our heart. One other thing, a couple of more things I want to say. The population explosion, people are going to have to die. That's simple. That's what's going to happen. Uh, let me say about our extinction. Um, Maybe we'll come back without the brain and we'll sniff, lick, and scratch. That may make the humans a little bit more effective. <laughs> and so, um, um, in all, what I think what we have to do is take a sense of who we are in this group, <clears throat> our realities. We have different points of view. How do we mix it up? The rich... They meet in athletic clubs or private clubs and they hang out on sofas and they drink their drinks and they smoke their cigars and they go, hey George, what's that coal mine doing down there in Africa? Oh, I don't know. I want to take it over. Okay, so the idea gets connected in a different context and work gets done. We have got to create for ourselves <clears throat> an environment that allows us to be comfortable with each other in a way that we can then trust and open up in dialogue uh, in a sensible, meaningful way without figuring out the solutions. Because I believe we're all on the Titanic. And guess what, folks? We don't have any lifeboats. Anybody else? Yep. A number of things I just want to comment on. Um, cooperation is the important thing now in the world. Uh, we, we built uh, the society, our ancestors and forefathers built, and foremothers built this society and most of what goes on in the world based on competition and that is being largely replaced by cooperation. Now there are good aspects to competition. We need to preserve those. And I'll, you know, if anybody wants to get into details with me, I'll be happy to talk with you about that. But 
we need to transition from largely competitive uh, uh, processes in the world to cooperative processes in what we in what we do. <clears throat> I want to speak to patents a little bit. What I know about patents. First of all, I am not an attorney. Nobody take anything that I say as legal advice, please. But it's my understanding that the way patents work, if somebody here has ideas and you want to create a patent, great, you need to have a notebook. You need to put, you know, like what this project is in the, like in the first page of the notebook. You need to write the date in and the time that you started doing work on the project and you put all of your notes that have to do with that patent in that one place. And then the patent, <clears throat> when it, if the patent is granted, is good for 17 years from the date that you started making notes about your ideas and started on the project. It's not from when you finish something. It's when you start the research project. Okay, so yeah, that's, these are just a few things I, uh, I want to say that I have learned a little bit about uh, having to do with patents. Um, yes, and by the way, Dave, we don't need to give women, their reproductive rights, and the rights to their bodies. They already have that. It has been taken away a lot by a lot of cultures. It's been ripped off, absolutely. So in that sense, it needs to be given back. Uh, we need to become aware that it was ripped off. Uh, but in a lot of places, you know, that women have all the rights that they need and need to really get it that they do have that power. And please, you know, use it as much as you can. Assert it. Assert it. Use it. Claim it. Be in that power. Oh, yeah. I'll probably have more to say, uh, but Dave wants to make a comment, I believe, on what I say. Well, that's kind of a combination of things. It's, you know, <clears throat> it's, it's very true that, you know, how we frame things, and especially looking at the fact that, yeah, under mother culture, which is industrial culture, Western industrial culture in particular, you know, Fundamental human rights have been taken away from women, but fundamental human rights have also been taken away from men. Yep. We, when you look at dominator hierarchies, dominator culture, when you look at force-based ranking hierarchies of domination, <clears throat> men over women is just a subset. You know, the larger picture is humans over nature. But we also have, you know, as, along with you know, men over women, we have whites over blacks, we have you know, one culture over another. There's a lot of things, you know, one God over another God and on and on and on. I mean, you know, we've come up with a whole lot of ways to try to rationalize basically bad behavior. <laughs> and this kind of goes in, when you look at how it's actually come to be, There's we get back to the same the core commonalities. And I'll use the patent office as a prime example. You know, patents fundamentally are based on greed and fear. Mm -hmm. All art is based on prior art. What happens with the patent office is that it actually puts up a roadblock to innovation. It uses the same mindset that Pentagon planners use. I mean, Pentagon planners go under this enlightenment assumption that we are not only disconnected from nature, but we are not capable of controlling ourselves. In fact, we need a strong state to keep us under control. So based on that assumption, we start looking then at some of the things around patents and the idea is that competition, which doesn't work the way life works, there's, there's really no good examples of competition in the natural world. It, and there's a long, we can go into that for, you know, in detail for a long time. But the idea behind Pentagon planners and war and war planning, the idea that we need to be controlled and the idea that Competition is actually what drives innovation. But that's nonsense. When you look at who we are as a species, we are innovative, we are inquisitive, we are intelligent. When you look at all the technologies we have today, metalworking, leatherworking, systems of administrative law, public works, writing, art, all of it came from initially from early partnership cultures. There is no one out there, you know, forcing a big financial carrot stick type operation. People invent stuff and build stuff and do stuff because that's what we like to do. The patent office is set up to protect people who are afraid somebody might take something from them and aren't willing to look at the fact that where they got it all in the first place. You know, it's all bit, you know, it's, you know, we come to this, the old saying is standing on the, you know, the shoulders of giants. Mm -hmm. 
And so these aspects need to be woven into there as well as we start looking at what we can do, how we got here, why it's not working, and what we can realistically do different. Because the point about free energy, I think, is a really good one. When you look at what the sustainable population limit of the globe really is, we have the technologies today to provide everyone with all the energy they need to have fulfilling lives. We don't have it for 7 billion people because, I mean, let's be honest, if we were to actually get, you know, Francis Moore LePay, whom, whom I love, but, you know, within that kind of mindset, you know, takes a viewpoint that we could feed the entire globe. It's a distribution problem, an agreed problem. Well, yeah, technically we could feed the entire globe and it would work for about two weeks and the earth would look like a swarm of locusts had totally leveled everything. That's the reality, and that's simple ecology. And so we have to start being honest about these things and looking at how we can, because, you know, as Josh was saying, we don't, you know, everyone's going to die. You know, none of us get out of life. The only people we have to kill are the ones who are immortal. I mean, mm -hmm. seriously. The rest of us, as we start looking at this thing within a framework and start looking at getting our population down to where it's sustainable and looking at the fact that with modern technology today, it takes one third of the global population to create everything the entire globe consumes. This means we should all be working two thirds less with full global employment at a living wage. The resources are there. I mean, that's just, I mean, once again, this is just really simple second grade math. So we can take these things and start looking at what we need to do to start moving in that direction. And understand that, you know, within two or three generations, we could be down there and we could be on the way. We could start taking these initial transition steps and working with all these groups that have a piece of the puzzle to move towards a community, towards societies that actually work with life. I'm very interested in this idea of universal basic income. And that would mean that everyone in, I guess, the world would receive a certain income every month. This would allow them time to refocus, heal themselves, and be able to take this leap that is needed to go into a eco-city, eco-village, and arcology world. So I propose that what we could do here, because the common denominator here is money and oppression, and if we can, we can change the economy by starting a campaign for universal basic income around the world. This idea is really happening now in Europe, and we can make it happen here in the United States. Um. Robert Heinlein wrote about that uh, basic life economy back in 1939, and it will actually, based on what I've been studying, allow us to move into that transitional phase because when, as you say, people have the opportunity to live a life without having to do the, the, the roteness, the same rote things every day to basically survive and are allowed to heal and allowed to become more creative and we have the open source society where we can all talk together and find out hey you know how's your country doing population wise what do your resources look like well this is what we have here or oh, this is what we have here then we can have a, a an accurate and caring um, survey of the carrying capacity of the planet otherwise you know I don't know what to believe from any of the scientists and any of the, the, the curriculum that's been taught in any of the institutions uh, heretofore. To date, I have just basically begun to question everything that has been given to me as absolute, but even, even you know, all these free energy things, bottom line is that there's enough evidence to show that what we're doing today is, is creating uh, a massive, um, just massive decimation of our planet. Overpopulation may be a result of the economic depravity that is, is so rampant around the planet. When we eliminate those things, people are able to be more cognizant in their, in their ability to decide and make good decisions 
about what they're going to do for themselves. Otherwise, everything is based on emotion and even on uh, the filtration of the, the illness that people are, are in because of the, the toxicity of, of the environment that we're in. So once we are able to understand that it, the money can no longer be equated to the resources, then we can begin to be free to determine the, in, the empirical data that we need to have in order to make any absolute claims about anything about this planet, because not a one of us really here know without everyone on this planet in consensus with all the data present. So, so we've gone around and um, solutions. We've heard some concrete. Maybe we got a general idea what this all is all about. There's there's an opportunity to begin, like Joshua says there, and what you've said. Uh, we can choose to do that, but for now, rather than capture everybody with one person talking, maybe we should adjourn our little meeting and just people do what they want to do here as far as coalition building or whatever. Yeah. What do you guys uh, want to do? Well, there is, uh, I was expecting somebody here, and there's, he was going to give a presentation. Uh, if we could take a break for a little bit, maybe meet outside for That's kind of a, a, a meet and greet and just a, a, a discussion, it'd be great. Okay? And if then there's I'll, no stuff going on at 6.15.